us today. I'll just give us a second while everybody comes into the room and uh, hopefully you can see me and hear me. Uh, we do have Maureen Green available in the chat, so if you are having any technical difficulties, she just popped a message in there. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate works towards an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high-tech fields. We do this through engaging project leaders and evaluators with information, expertise, and tools to advance high-quality evaluation. Be sure to check out our website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, and you may also download them by following the link on the right side of your screen. The recording will be available within a couple of days, and that will be emailed directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Gina Venegas is our presenter today. She's a research and evaluation consultant serving programs and organizations looking to foster inclusive environments that engage underrepresented communities and projects that increase social capital. I'd also like to recognize the Evaluate team who've worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. Maureen, who as I said, will be available in the chat for any technical needs. Kelly, Lissa, Megan, Lori, and Erica. A special thank you goes to Maureen Hoffman with TPMA, who was this webinar's ATE community reviewer and provide valuable feedback at our webinar rehearsal. And as always, we thank our copy editor, Carolyn Williams Noren. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. And this is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I'll go ahead and turn things over to Gina. Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning, depending on what time zone you are in. I'm Dr. Gina Venegas, I'm an independent research and data evaluation consultant. And I am here to talk about transforming um, STEM education, unleashing qualitative insights for inclusive learning environments. Okay, so I'm excited to see all of you here and I look forward to learning more about who you are. So in this next poll, I would love to know who we have here in the audience, if you're an evaluator, a PI, project staff, or perhaps if you don't see a relevant option here, you can select other. You should see the poll on your screen now. Once you have responded, we'll get a chance to see um, who we have here in the audience today. All right, see some answers coming in. Okay, looks like we have uh, 70% of you are evaluators. Welcome, welcome. 4% uh, of you are PIs or project leads and 9% of you are project staff. We have a few grant professionals and then we have a lot of other. If you select that other, would you mind dropping in the chat uh, what your current role is or how you relate to evaluation? I'd love to know. All right, well, welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Let's talk about today's agenda. My intention is that this webinar helps expand your view of how qualitative evaluation can strengthen your project and attune to your project's diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. First, we'll talk about the why this is important and what is the rationale for using qualitative evaluation to advance DEI goals. Um, I believe this is just as important as the how so next, we'll talk about how to integrate qualitative evaluations into your projects in a way that is congruent with your project's DEI goals. Before we do that, um, I think it's important that we align on what we mean by DEI. You may or may not have already been familiar with this acronym. However, I thought it would be important for us to explicitly say what DEI means within the context of evaluation. So for this webinar's purposes, 
when we talk about diversity, we are referring to the celebration of diversity of thought, experience, and background. Equity means that we understand that not a size fits all, particularly when we're talking about evaluation, and that we recognize the importance of using culturally relevant approaches in our projects. Inclusion highlights the importance, acceptance, and appreciation of all voices, the need to promote a sense of belonging and representation in celebration of diversity of diverse groups of people. Within inclusion, it also recognizes the need for accessibility. This translates to the data collection methods that we use, the language we utilize to speak to and about the people we serve, and how we use technology to facilitate or not accessibility. Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you a little more about what informs my perspective as an evaluator and professional. So I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. You can see a beautiful picture of Bogota on the right side of your screen. I immigrated to the US when I was 16 years old. I'm a first generation college graduate and I'm the first in my family to attain a PhD. Woohoo! I'm bicultural and bilingual, which means I have a cultural understanding of the Latina experience and I, an identity. And I also speak both English and Spanish, though Spanglish is how I really best express myself. My pronouns are she, her, ella. My educational background includes a PhD in counseling psychology from University of California, Santa Barbara. And counseling psychologists utilize a strength-based perspective to social issues, as social justice is the bedrock that informs our practice. I'm also a qualitative researcher and have a passion for merging applied research and data with practice. Throughout my career, I have served, collaborated, and partnered with underrepresented groups, and in my work as an evaluator, I utilize an ecosystemic approach, which we'll talk more about later on. And as a consultant, I work with organizations who are interested in better engaging with underrepresented communities through data and professional development. Okay, well, now that you know a little bit more about what informs my practice, let's talk at high level why we should use qualitative data in our evaluations and projects. So qualitative data is culturally congruent with the rich oral traditions of communities of color. It can provide an empowering platform for individuals' voices to be heard, and it's an effective tool in facilitating the understanding of complex issues and the contextual factors that surround them. I'm curious, what types of qualitative data do you currently use in your evaluation projects? You're going to see a poll launch in a few minutes. Oh, it's there. Samantha is on it. Um, please select from there which types do you currently use. Okay, I'm going to give you some time to answer. Okay, looks like about oh there's sort of answers coming in great i love it okay so we have about 62 percent of you are using individual interviews that's wonderful 15 percent of you are using focus groups um 22 percent of you are using open-ended questions and surveys and uh, a few of you are using uh art or process activity based data wonderful Okay, so it looks like all of you are using qualitative data at this point in time in some sort of way. So that's wonderful to hear. Okay. Let's talk about um, the why. So though there are many ways to collect qualitative data for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus specifically on the use of focus groups and interviews as data gathering methods. And we'll talk about the why. So here are some common problems uh, that from my own practice as an evaluator and experience as a researcher, I've noticed um, that happen in evaluation that I believe contribute to the disparities that we see in education and other social services. 
The first one is this overuse of surveys. There's also a lack of cultural congruence in the use of these surveys. And these first two problems contribute to the low response rates and engagement that we see in surveys, which ultimately lead us to have a lack of depth in our understanding of the complexity and context of an issue we're trying to assess as evaluators. Our use of surveys, our overuse of surveys, I should say, is an issue in that surveys overly rely in reading and writing skills, which is not many people's preferred communication method, particularly for those who, for example, English is not their first language. When we use surveys, we miss opportunities for connection. So we have to remember that we are interpersonal beings that thrive in connection with others. In this way, focus groups allow for a synergy of ideas and promote a sense of shared reality and community in a way that surveys just do not. Surveys are also not a great medium for qualitative inquiry. So while you may be able to incorporate open-ended questions in surveys, potential responses may not be as useful as those obtained through a focus group or an interview because there's limited space in terms of what people can write and, what it, and it also requires additional um, work for the survey responder. If you think about it, oftentimes these open-ended questions tend to be at the end of the survey where people have already spent quite a bit of energy getting through the survey. So those last questions don't tend to get as much attention for that reason. It's also important to remember that utilizing open-ended questions in a survey is just one medium of qualitative inquiry. There are many that you can choose from. Um, so I want to invite you to diversify the types of approaches that you utilize to gather the qualitative data. Surveys often lack cultural congruence and that high context cultures have rich oral traditions that can be assets in evaluation and should be explored through the use of focus groups and interviews. There's also a need for language justice in evaluation. Sometimes a survey or protocol might be poorly translated or not offered in other languages. Um, an unfortunate trend that I see across organizations and sectors is whoever on a team is bilingual is asked to translate and interpret. And I just want to caution you against this. We have to be very careful about these practices for a number of reasons. One is that not everyone who is bilingual has the content knowledge vocabulary and formal language to translate documentation with fidelity and professionalism. Second, these practices overburden bilinguals professional in that these activities often fall outside of the scope of their job description, compensation and training. The third reason why there's a lack of cultural congruence in service is because the context in which participants experience a resource or a program or service is often missing. And this limits our understanding of the systemic issues that impact their engagement and the very services that are geared towards them. I think we often see low response rates of engagement in evaluation activities as a result of the two um, earlier reasons I stated earlier. We're all over surveyed. Um, think about how many surveys did you receive this month? The, the likelihood is a lot. Right now, everyone is using surveys for any kind of service. Even when you go to the doctor, you receive services, um, surveys, right? So this means that as consumers, we have to prioritize which surveys we respond to. And according to one of the leading softwares for survey development, 50%, 15%, that's a one and a five, 15% is the typical response rate. So one concern that I often hear about using focus groups and interviews is about the limited number of participants we can access feedback from. But if you think about it, our survey samples are not usually representing a wide range of experiences for all participants. The difference is that qualitative data actually provides depth and understanding in a way that is difficult to do with surveys. A factor explaining low survey response rates can also be distrust, particularly among underrepresented communities. 
which brings me to back to the importance of recognizing back again that we are interpersonal interpersonal beings. A focus groups and interviews can provide an opportunity to build trust through interpersonal connection that then later can be leveraged to promote engagement. All these issues mentioned previously impact our understanding of why of the why of a problem or issue and how we can resolve it. Other contributing factors to this uh, limited understanding include our overfocus on outcome data rather than process data, which hinders our ability to assess the experiences of underrepresented students at different points throughout their journey in receiving the services or resources or programs that we offer. There are hidden gems that hide in the context and complexity of an issue. When we utilize methodologies such as focus groups and interviews, these offer us wonderful, rich information that can lend to more actionable solutions that are relevant for the very participants that we aim to serve. We better understand their experiences, create connection, and build trust. This is at least our hope. I want to share a case study that I worked on so you can better appreciate what qualitative insights can do for your project. I worked with an organization that wanted to assess the impact of a nutrition curriculum for the Latina community. And in the past, they had collected quantitative outcome data, such as the number of people served, demographics, satisfaction ratings, which we could spend a whole webinar on why this is not often a great indicator, but we won't do that here. However, what they found is that the numbers only provided them with a limited understanding of how the curriculum was performing and the impact it had on the people receiving it. But the numbers didn't really explain was the why behind the satisfaction ratings they were receiving. Why were some folks completing the entire program while others withdrew before completion? How participants were using the skills they learned, if at all, after the program ended, and how did participating in this program impact their life? how people navigated food insecurity, and how the program could further support them in navigating these systemic challenges. So I think in response to this missing information, we created focus groups for alumni and added qualitative process measures at different points during the program to get a better sense of participants' experiences. What we learned was that the culturally congruent aspect of that curriculum facilitated participants' self-efficacy in using the skills learned after the program ended. In this way, surveys provide certainly an important piece of the puzzle, while qualitative data fill another piece of that information. I'd love to know what areas are you curious to explore further in your current projects? You can put your answers in the chat box. Hopefully this gets your brain going and thinking about potential ways you can use qualitative data. All right. I think I'm gonna go ahead and... Mm, students dropping out. Yes, that's a great... Um, that's a great uh, opportunity to explore there, I think. Why are people withdrawing from the program earlier? Why are they not completing it? What's going on there? Ooh, student confidence, yes. Survey design of questions, absolutely. Sense of belonging, I think it's a great um, construct to explore to go through qualitative data. Teachers change in instructional practice. Oh, I've actually used that before with a school district I've worked with. Increasing response rate for surveys, that would be helpful. The impact of healing practices, oh my gosh, yes. DEIA, accessibility and inclusion, absolutely. These are great um, concepts to explore, great ideas to kind of dig in as to the why and the how of a program that I think are really important to explore, particularly when it comes to engaging underserved communities. Okay.
keep the ideas coming. I'm going to move us along, but I want you to have the chance to also explore um, other ideas. Now let's talk about how qualitative data relates to your projects and DEI goals. An effective um, and inclusive project evaluation will help um, will help you as the PI and as the evaluator identify inequities that exist in the accessibility and utilization of your services. It also should effectively respond to students' needs as well as those who serve them. Get community buy-in to effectively engage those you intend to serve. And provide accountability and transparency for your project. It should also represent a diversity of voices that guide your project. Inclusion in education begins with the way we think about engagement. When I walk, when I talk about engagement, I'm talking about engagement in both the services, resources, or programs designed to serve underrepresented communities, as well as these communities' engagement in evaluation activities. So I like to use metaphors and I love to dance. So this is my way of combining both, okay? So bear with me. When we think about engagement, we think and talk about it in terms of the individual, assuming that engagement is an individual dance like ballet. And how this is represented in evaluation is looking at outcome measures of skills and knowledge learned, intervention, attrition rates, number of student serves. These measures often focus on the individual. So we ask questions such as, did students attend the services offered? How many sessions or what portion of the intervention did they receive? What did they learn or gain by participating in this program or service? And unfortunately, this overemphasizes the individual's responsibility in the change we seek to create. However, as with most social problems, the root cause is often systemic. Sometimes we also think about engagement as a couple stance in that there's the student um, or individual we're trying to serve and the project or service being provided. So we might assess things like, are there types of resources or services being provided sufficient? Did we implement this project with fidelity? Are staff competent in serving the communities we're serving? Though this is a better model than the first one, it is not yet sufficient because as I said, most social problems are systemic and that's really the case for education inequities. Oops, there we go. In this sense, we need to think about engagement as more of a group dance in that there are many factors beyond the individual and project who act as facilitators and barriers to the success of students in STEM. Qualitative tools such as focus groups and individual interviews allow us to better understand the complex relationship between these factors and how the individual navigates the systems to promote their own success. So let's take an example of the disengaged student. What might be labels the student may receive? Um, student might be thought to lack discipline, might be thought to be uninterested or distracted or even lazy. Our perception of the problem impacts the way we speak about the problem and the way we tackle or not a problem. And so we want to be very careful to not frame people as the problem and instead look at the contextual factors so as to find a more accurate why and solution. I deeply believe that it's these very narratives that perpetuate the very inequities the limit access to social mobility resources for underrepresented communities. So instead, we might look at how different factors impact the student's behavior. We might look at individual factors like, what is the student's documentation status? What's going on with their family? Are they a first-generation college student? Do they have any other economic pressures that they're juggling? 
We might look at project-specific factors such as, well, the timing of the intervention or services offered, is it actually matching the student's needs? We might look at the dosage of an intervention received. Well, was it too much? Was it too little resources? Were we providing too much information, too little? We might also look at acceptability of the interventions and services provided. You can also look at contextual factors, which is the part that I was mentioning earlier is missing often. These contextual factors can act as barriers and facilitators to their engagement. So for example, there could be <clears throat> exclusionary educational practices university policies and procedures that get in the way of their academic achievement. There could be a lack of needed funding for students to pursue professional development opportunities. For this reason, we need to contextualize the behavior of those we serve and gather data that represents the, the who, demographic data, the what, which services do they utilize, when do they utilize such services? Where are they most likely to use such services? And why? The beliefs, the attitudes, the expectations, the behavioral insight. To answer the question, under what circumstances do our consumers come to access our services and find them beneficial? The why is very difficult to glean from surveys. Does the need for focus groups and interviews as they provide us with behavioral insight needed to better understand underrepresented students' experiences and address inequities in education. These help us glean insights on why individuals utilize an intervention or not and how it works or not for them. These tools help us capitalize on the rich oral traditions of communities of color and high context cultures. They have been shown to be empowering for those who participate in it, provide a platform for those who are not typically heard from in research or evaluation. So to sum it all up, qualitative data can be culturally congruent provide a rich outlook on the impact you have and future direction you may take as a PI, provide insight into attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, why service recipients utilize an intervention or service and how these resources enhance their lives, and provide a platform for empowering experiences for participants. As with anything, right, we, we, we know what we want to do, we know what we should do, but sometimes there's barriers, right? So I am curious, what has prevented you from utilizing focus groups and interviews before? You should see a poll launch um, already, looks like you're already answering, fantastic. Okay, looks like got more coming in, which is wonderful. If you selected other in this poll, I would love to know in the chat what those other barriers are, because I actively want to work to really remove these barriers for us all who are interested in continuing this work. Okay, so it looks like 22% of you saying budgetary limits, 40% uh, of you are saying lack of time, 17% are saying perception that qualitative data is not rigorous, 3% um, are saying lack of understanding about qualitative data, and then 15% of you are saying other. Okay. All right, so we'll talk about um, some of these in the next section. But before I get that, um, I get there, Let's do a quick check-in and answer any questions that you might have so far. I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha. Thank you, Gina. Uh, we actually don't have any questions to, oh, now we do. <laughs> 
Um, okay. Our first question, what proportion of your evaluation practice consists of qualitative methods compared to quantitative methods? Hmm. I definitely um, would say <laughs> that most of the evaluation I do is qualitative. Um, and we use quantitative to triangulate and to add rigor to the findings that we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we don't have any additional questions right now, but I just wanna remind everybody you can leave questions in the chat and we'll have another question break coming up. Oh, I'm so, we actually just had one come in here. So any advice for dealing with skeptics who think participants might not be comfortable sharing in person? I would be curious. I'm curious about this question. Um, hmm. I'm curious about this question. I don't know if they mean um, that they're holding groups in person and they're saying people don't will feel comfortable or others are saying to them that people don't feel comfortable coming in person and answering information um, versus holding virtual focus groups. So I do both. I, I hold virtual focus groups and I also um, hold them in person. So that's why I'm having a hard time answering this one. But I would say that if um, if someone is a skeptic in terms of, well, people might not want to talk about these topics um, in person in front of others is understandable. However, I think it's about, I think sometimes people lack an understanding of what goes into creating a focus group protocol. And one of the things that I personally really um, heavily <laughs> work on is making sure that I'm layering my questions and that I am framing my focus group and my outreach information in a way that is actually inviting of expertise of those who are coming who I'm hoping to to talk to, right? So I think you can always showcase what are some ways that you, um, what are some strategies that you're using as an evaluator to help build a sense of trust and uh, safety in the focus groups that you're hoping to run. So that's my approach, I would say. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, uh, they would appreciate your point of view on how to evaluate qualitative studies for use in project design. Focus group and interviews are often useful to refine local interventions, but when looking for studies to cite or to guide project design, the gold standard of RCTs consistently dominate. Put another way, if a project evaluation is qualitative, how can it best be structured to be useful and referenced by the broader educational community? Yeah. This is definitely we're talking more about research now. How do we use evaluation, particularly qualitative evaluation in the uh, research area? Um, this is a really good question. I'll share kind of I that's not something I would say is a priority in my practice, but I can also understand why there's a need for that. Right. And so the advocacy part of 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 using qualitative data um, to really kind of help move forward or kind of dispel this, this idea that qualitative studies don't have as much rigor as like an RCT or gold standard. And what I always come down to is when we're looking at underserved populations, when we're looking at communities of color, when we're working with underrepresented folks, if you were to look at those RCTs, these are not often very inclusive. And so I think that's what I'm trying to convey here is that a lot of the quantitative um, studies, a lot of the RCTs don't tend to really hold and honor the narratives and experiences of people um, who have rich oral traditions, who have been traditionally left behind. So to me, it's a matter of purpose. Who, who are we trying to serve? And here's a methodology that has really been successful in hoping and creating a sense of trust for communities who are not typically represented in evaluation or in research. So I think that's how I typically look at it. That said, I do reference um, research studies in my evaluation findings often. 
So when I'm making a recommendation, and I know people feel differently about recommendations, but when I'm making a recommendation, I'm making sure that I am citing a lot of the research literature that supports that recommendation in addition to what I'm hearing from what the community is saying. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Gina. And we do have a couple more. I'm going to do one more now, and then we'll make sure that we address the rest later. Um, but do you have a preference for focus group over interviews? And if so, why? We all have our biases. Um, so I'm not going to pretend I don't because, yes, I definitely prefer focus groups personally. Um, the reason why is the synergy of ideas that come from a focus groups. So oftentimes we feel our experiences, we feel alone in our experiences, I think. And when you're able to hear from others how they relate to a particular problem, it's just a beautiful thing to, to see how people can build community, feel validated and normalize their experiences with others. So for me, I prefer focus groups because of the connection that it can help people feel. Um, and I just, I don't think that there's a better feeling personally that than when I see folks saying things like, oh, I didn't know that other people felt that way. Or, oh my gosh, yes, I've thought about that. And here's what I think about that. Um, and so that universality that comes from being in, in, in a group and in an interpersonal interaction where there's other ideas, I think that is, for me, that's like my favorite thing um, when I'm doing evaluation. So a bit of a romantic answer there. Okay, thank you. And again, go ahead and keep the questions coming and we'll make sure to address those at the next break. Okay, so let's talk about the how. Um, now, how do we identify opportunities for qualitative data? Okay, here you see the evaluation cycle, which also follows the project design cycle. So let's talk about the planning process. During the planning process, it's a great way to embed qualitative data measures by doing needs assessments before creating or launching a project. In this way, we can take a more collaborative approach to project design. So instead of taking a hierarchical approach where we, the powers that be, design a project based on what we think students need. We instead invite them to the table and understand better their needs and recommendations. In this way, utilizing qualitative data gathering methods during this stage can be highly advantageous. We might ask questions like, what do students need? What's the problem at hand? How do they experience it? And what are their own personal goals around this? Sometimes during the trajectory of the project, say for example, the midpoint um, of a program or intervention or service, we might do a temperature check in which we ask questions such as, are we implementing the project with fidelity? How is the project being received? Are the services being utilized? During this stage, I can admit that it can be challenging to incorporate opportunities for qualitative data gathering beyond incorporating open-ended questions and measures meant to act as temperature checks. At the end of an intervention is another natural opportunity to integrate focus groups and interviews because project activities have likely ended and thus there may be more capacity to collect qualitative data. So here, we get to explore big questions like, why did the intervention work or not? How was the service effective? Why did students provide the responses they did in an outcome survey? How did they navigate the challenges that came up during the implementation of the project? What recommendations do they have for future projects that would better engage them, serve them, or orient them towards their own personal goals? We need to think about evaluation and the engagement of underrepresented students as cooking. There's a lot of planning we do if we are preparing to host family or friends for dinner. We might ask what dietary restrictions they might have, what sort of food others enjoy, and pick a recipe based on this information. 
So similarly, we want to invite the expertise of students in the development of projects, services, and interventions we create for them. This emphasizes collaboration and provides opportunities for them to voice their concerns, needs, and even recommendations for what would be most helpful, acceptable, and engaging. So here are some considerations for developing a successful qualitative strategy. Kind of coming back to what you were all sharing during the uh, barriers poll that we were talking about. Um, so budget is something that folks most often are concerned about. Um, in my experience, working with nonprofits with very limited resources, we've been able to figure this out. And that's because many times it comes down to what gets prioritized. So if we're saying that we're committed to creating inclusive learning environments, then we need to quote unquote, put our money where our mouth is. Inclusiveness takes intentionality and intentionality takes time, right? So sometimes I will say in organizations, initiatives that focus on DEI objectives are the first to be cut down. So let's make sure that we don't also perpetuate these patterns and contribute to the inequities that already exist in the education system. We instead need to reaffirm our commitment to equity in education by being strategic with our funds and making sure we properly budget for the labor intensive nature that's required with qualitative data. The second is compensation. It's another con consideration needed. Beware of reinforcing the same inequities that underrepresented already face, uh, underrepresented students already face in education and compensate them for their time and expertise. So you want to make sure you plan this out in advance in your budget, especially if we're asking folks to participate in say an hour long focus group. The third consideration that I will leave you with today, because there really are many more, is cultural relevance. Let's make sure that we're utilizing language justice principles in our projects by honoring the language or preference of students and not only those the institution, the project staff or evaluator is comfortable in. Proficiency may differ from preference. For example, I'm proficient in both English and Spanish, but depending on the topic, I might be most comfortable speaking in Spanish or Spanglish, in which means I code switch in the same conversation. This is, of course, um, this of course means that your evaluator needs to have a cultural understanding of the culture of students you're aiming to serve. Lastly, representation really does matter. We cannot be what we cannot see. There simply are topics that are difficult to share with those who have the privilege to not face the similar systemic challenges that these, um, that these often relate to systemic issues that underrepresented students face in academia. And if our goal is to identify these, then we need to do our best to provide a safe space for students to talk about their experiences. Next, I want to showcase an example of how I've utilized these principles in the past. So I work with a large urban school district serving primarily students of color and students receiving free and reduced lunch. I wanted to create a college access curriculum for their students. The problem was that they identified that through their, well, they actually identified this through their quantitative data um, and they noticed that there were high rates of students being admitted to four-year colleges, but low rates of admitted students graduating from those same four-year universities. And so they were wondering why this happened. They wanted to understand the why of the case and how to address it through a tailored curriculum because they had found that a package curriculum was not specifically designed for the students that they had in mind. So they wanted to create something that was tailored to the students' needs that they were serving. So they sought and received a grant in which a portion of the grant went to conducting a community needs assessment 
another went to designing the curriculum, and another that went to evaluating the impact of the curriculum. The school district's goal was to create a tailored curriculum for students that would help them learn the necessary skills to actually be successful in higher education and complete a four-year degree. So the first thing we did was to engage multiple stakeholders in the evaluation process because it was important to highlight multiple perspectives. So we conducted focus groups with those in the school system, such as students, teachers, school counselors, administrators, parent facilitators. We basically talked to anybody who would talk to us. <laughs> the family system. Um, we also talked to the family system. So parents, guardians, family, we invited the, them to participate in the focus groups. And we also talked to those who had already left the system, such as alumni. The second thing we did uh, was we were very intentional in our outreach efforts and properly translated all outreach messaging in addition to focus groups and interview protocols in a way that honored the different needs of multiple subsets of the school community. Third, we remain flexible in our scheduling and the interview modality we use to attune to the community's needs. When events that negatively impacted the communities we were trying to speak to, we took notice and we rescheduled as needed. Fourth, we focus, um, focus groups and interview facilitators represented the communities that were invited to the table. In turn, through our approach, we were able to identify the importance of developing the following skills and knowledge as necessary in navigating higher education as underrepresented students. We noticed that social, social emotional skills such as perseverance, emotional regulation, handling setbacks, etc., were really important. Second, Stakeholders share that cultural awareness and identity exploration would also be beneficial in helping students navigate systemic challenges that they would face in higher education. Third, there were several takeaways for professional development of staff at all levels of the school district. And we also identified the need for a school policy that addressed the needs of minoritized populations within that school system in particular. The neat thing was that because we talked to different um, stakeholders within the school system, our uh, takeaways for professional development were also tailored based on the role of those folks who we talked to. I would love to check in and provide an opportunity to answer any questions you might have. Okay. We've got a couple of questions in there, Gina. So first up, do you have a recommendation on the best way to analyze open-ended survey data along with collected demographic data? I'm not sure that I have a particular way of analyzing this. Um, we do use some open-ended surveys, um, open-ended questions in our surveys, but we mainly rely on focus groups and interviews. So I don't know that I have a particular answer to it. Mainly I look through patterns of answers and what we're seeing. So that might be helpful. Um, but maybe somebody else here has a better suggestion. Okay, thank you. And how do you handle stakeholder or leadership who don't understand the context of what qualitative data has to offer? Um, so this comes up again a lot in my work, particularly because I use a lot of qualitative methodologies in my work. So I really um, talk to them about the cultural congruence piece. So a lot of what we talked about in the why is a lot of the points that I make with them from the beginning of who are we trying to serve and reminding them of that throughout the entire process of who are we trying to serve? What is the best way to serve them from a methodological standpoint? 
what's going to create the opportunities that you're hoping to see in engagement, not just in the evaluation process, but beyond the evaluation. So when even I'm, when I'm gone, right, we want them to be able to feel connected to um, the project, the organization itself, right? And so this is a great way for us to um, start building that. That And um, so those are the things that I kind of typically talk about. And the idea of having uh, communities of color and underserved communities having rich oral traditions and using that as assets, um, thinking of them as assets rather than, oh, well, let's throw a survey at them and see if they'll answer let's we're not going to get the result that they're hoping to see so i think i remind clients a lot about that thank you what tool do you use while transcribing data from focus groups mm, i've used a number of them um so far one that i came across uh, through another evaluator uh, her name is becky Guerra, and she's also really wonderful it's OneDrive, a word apparently has this uh, way that you can actually um, transcribe really easily. I've also used uh, the Zoom transcribing uh, option that it has. And we also look through the actual transcript to make sure that it is being done correctly. So there's like a lot of different steps that we take to transcribe the data. So maybe try those out. Okay, uh, and Diana said this is a great presentation and they'd like to read more on the topic because there are parts uh, to reference in the thesis paper. So just wondering if there's any papers, websites, or books that you recommend uh, that she could dig in more on. I'm writing one. I don't have one right now that I could recommend, but I, I, I'm writing one at the moment. So hopefully it comes out by the time you need it. But um there's also more information about just myself and i can go after that uh, on to just how to contact me and whatnot but uh, on my website you can find more information about my work as well um so i think that's kind of where i would say feel free to email me i can share more uh, via email okay do you have recommendations on trainings on how to conduct community needs assessments I do not, but I'm sure you can find um, you can find any trainings um, that you're looking for. So I don't know. I'm sure that um, Evaluate has wonderful trainings. Is one place that I can think of that I always go to for resources. So I would check those out because they have so much information on their website as well. Thank you. And of course, if anybody on um, today's presentation has ideas of resources that might be helpful, you know, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, okay, you have an excellent grasp of this process, use, process using interviews and focus groups to extract data for evaluation. Are there tools you have that can be used by field personnel often on the front line? um let's see so you're wanting to do this you're in the front lines you're wanting to do this type of evaluation i actually work with organizations who um want to train their frontline staff how to do this in a way that is feasible because i think that's also one of the barriers is time right so i do work with organizations in helping train the entire organization um, on different aspects of it so that it they have a cohesive evaluation framework that is feasible for even the folks who are in the front line. So everybody takes a, a step or takes a, a piece of the evaluation. So there are ways that you could do it, but I think it's an, as an organization, you have to kind of address it. Um, so again, I'm happy to share more um, if you have any questions about that. Okay. Uh, how successful were you in reaching alumni with your interviews and focus groups? Very, because we had incentives. Um, and it's also, again, you have to be so intentional about who is reaching out, who, um, how we're reaching out to them, um, how we're inviting them to participate, 
our scheduling. There's so many things that go into it that is not just, again, like let's send an email and for a survey and see if they respond. So I think intentionality is where um, success comes in terms of an engagement from an engagement perspective. So making sure that you have those incentives is one piece of it. The other piece is who has the relationship that's closest to um, with this alumni. And then are you inviting them to share what exactly? Um, what are you inviting them to share that would be exciting and important to them? I think that's key. Do you have any recommendations for qualita qualitative analysis methodologies focused specifically on evaluation? Yeah, um, I don't, I'm sorry. I wish I had more resources. Um, we do use a lot of thematic analysis in our work. So I'm not sure what else there might be out there. I'm sure there is. And I know that Evaluate has like wonderful resources. So maybe that would be one place to look. Okay, thank you. Uh, and circling back to incentives, what kind of incentives uh, could be offered? Um, so those can range, right? It doesn't always have to be monetary. Um, sometimes I've worked with um, food banks who might offer credits to buy food at a local for farmer's market. Or it might be... Um, like in schools, I've, I've seen things like, oh, you know, maybe they get uh, to participate in a special activity or they get to be, you know, there's like creative ways that you can go about um, incentives that don't require to be uh, money related. Obviously, again, if we're asking for an hour or someone, particularly in terms of communities, I do think that um, monetary is an important aspect because otherwise we're competing with other opportunities for them to earn an income, right? And so if we're hoping to engage them, then we also have to be mindful about, about that. Okay, thank you, Gina. And that is the last of the questions we'll have time for. So I'll let you move to your next slide. Sounds good. So my hope is that this webinar was helpful to you all, um, but it's more important that to me, that you actually put it into practice. So if you are a PI, project staff, or funder, I'd love to support you in how to strategically use qualitative data to advance your project's DEI goals. On my website, you can schedule an initial consultation and I can help you identify opportunities to embed these strategies that we talked about today into your current or future projects. For my evaluator colleagues, if you are looking to collaborate, Feel free to connect with me or learn more about my work via email. I'm going to turn it over to Samantha now. A lot of teamwork here at the end. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, as I said, you can find the slides from today are available on our website. The recording will be available within a few days. That will be on our website, but we'll also email it directly to you. Um, and of course, we love evaluation. So uh, please complete our feedback survey. You should see that on your screen now. We'd love to know how we did and what areas we could improve in. And we use that with our trainings and webinars going forward. So again, we appreciate uh, you joining us in all of your engagement today. And thank you, Gina, for a wonderful presentation. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.